What is going on, Coaster Spotters? This is Alex for the Coaster Spot at another location where we're not gonna see any roller coasters. I really need to create a second channel. If you're on that channel already, this is obviously a repost, but we are at the Smithsonian Institute National Air and Space Museum, the Stephen F. Ilvar Hazy Center. Uh, this is located right near the Dulles Airport, and it is absolutely huge in comparison to the one that you'll find in the middle of DC. So many exhibits, there's a space shuttle in here. Uh, looks like they're expanding. This is my third time here, first time vlogging, but uh, I'm very excited to be back here. Uh, it is free to come inside, uh, but uh, parking is $15 these days, so be aware of that. All right, so here's the map if you want to scan it on your TV, but it looks like Part of it's closed right now. They're not adding on. Didn't think they were, because this place is already huge. So that's a little unfortunate, but uh, it's another reason to come back and do another video eventually. But here we go. Here's the first view you get as you walk from the lobby area to the giant hangar. And this place is huge one of the biggest buildings I've ever been in and then right back there perfectly centered is first of all a blackbird which is cool in its own right but then a space shuttle that's and in space I, it doesn't get cooler than that so yeah unfortunately the left side of the building looks like they're doing a bunch of rehab to it which is uh, unfortunate but there's still so much to see and do and uh, I'm not used to doing videos on museums, so I'm gonna do my best and just show you the things that really interest me. It might not be the stuff that people typically gravitate to. I do have a few upcharge things, a bunch of simulator rides. Looks like they range from eight to $12. But over in this section though, you can see some of the earliest planes of aviation can be seen here. And it's very neat how this one, they've actually cut away one side of the, uh, the airplane so you can see inside the structure that makes it up. And this is just one small section of the museum. I mean, there are so many planes. I have no idea how many, but there's hundreds of planes on exhibit. And stuff that uh, I haven't been here for about three years now and I already can see that a lot of stuff has been swamped out which is fantastic to see that restoration wing that we're going to show you which they very neat to see that stuff usually and what's going on there this time and uh just to let you know though in October of 2021 masks are still required due to the ongoing global health situation so if you're visiting uh just be aware of that probably is going to be around for a while especially since this is a government owned facility Definitely gonna start with a showstopper here. Uh, B-29 Super Fortress, the Enola Gay, which um, is pretty much the most deadly plane ever in the history of mankind, concerning it dropped a atomic bomb on Hiroshima in 1945. So, uh, I mean, the B-29 is not exactly that most special of a plane. I mean, prolific career, definitely. But uh, this one is <laughs> very special, obviously. We'll get another view of it from above. Uh, so I think they're just doing a lot of work on the roof and to protect the planes from possible dust or debris. Uh, they have everything covered up. So it's kind of closed, but at the same time, like you still can get a good idea of what we're looking at for sure. Uh, and what we're looking here is a Boeing 367, which is uh, the prototype, I believe, which is obviously a very iconic plane for commercial aviation. And from one iconic jet in commercial aviation to another, and here's the Air France Concorde, which is the one and only successful supersonic plane to carry civilians. Had a pretty long career, but uh, was pretty much died off by the uh, recession and 9-11 when it was just was not economical for uh, to fly it anymore and and most of the time it was being flown 
by executives and whatnot where companies were paying for their travel. Uh, it just was not economical for a random person to fly on this thing. So it was so expensive. And they barely ever made any money, if any. So as I expected, yep. Everything I uh, thought earlier is true. Just work on the roof to protect. And everything's covered up to protect the exhibits and, and everyone here. And you can see that everything's grouped up into general categories. We definitely have to check out number 12. As I love everything Germany. And uh, we'll get to the, the space shuttle, of course. Keeping that for a little bit later. I'm not going to start with the showstopper. But uh, here's another view of the entire facility. I mean, said it is huge. I will say, though, it, if you have little, little kids, I, the, the one in Washington, D.C. probably will pique their interest a little bit more since the exhibits are smaller. There is a lot of interactivity there. Whereas here, it's it's kind of just a bunch of planes in a giant hangar, which, I mean, is pretty cool in its own right. But, uh, uh, yeah. And it, this place is not easy to get to, obviously. Uh, I don't know if there's even a public transportation option from the mid middle of Washington, D.C. Uh, there should be, but I don't even know. Comment down below if there is. But here's a look at that Concorde. I would have loved to have flown on this thing, but uh, not a lot of people were able to, obviously. There's that long nose, that ability to um, actually pitch down during takeoff and landing so that they could actually see the runway since it had to take off and land at such a high angle. And then we have a bunch of small little planes in here. Like, I love this little thing. It's basically a car and a plane in one. And then you get into things like sport aviation, which is so neat. Like, look at this little plane right here. Like, basically, uh, there is no tail, and it's just made for speed. And it was basically a kit, and it was priced at $27.95, which, uh, heck, back then in 1980s, funny? Heck, that doesn't even seem all that bad. Although I'm sure it was very hard to fly. This plane has 40 hours on it, and I don't think I could ever fit into it. Another sport aviation plane, 120 miles per hour top speed. Look how sleek that is for the, the 1980s for sure. And then here's a look at the other portion of the building that isn't covered up. And then Nola Gay down there, which is, I mean, rightfully so, it's a pretty cool plane in its own right, but that one is really special. Uh, Piper, which is a very well-known plane, but uh, this one's kind of special. These were built in Pennsylvania, my home state, which is kind of cool. But uh, yeah, this was used um, for uh, uranium exploration, which is uh, really neat. I had an instrument on board its tail to uh, detect gamma radiation. That, that's pretty cool. So, in previous visits, I didn't really read much of the information things, and I think I'm gonna spend a lot of time today doing that, but like something like this, uh, it's the glider, but this glider broke a altitude record for a glider back in uh, 1986. I'm not sure if that record still stands, but the guy got up to 49,000 feet before uh, he had to go down because it was so cold and his uh, seal on his ma air mask broke. But uh, yeah, it went down to negative uh, 58 degrees up at that altitude. That's, that's crazy. You know, just a blackbird right there and a space shuttle right there. No, no big deal. None at all. We're definitely going to spend a lot of time in there. I don't think anything has changed in here though, unfortunately. So every plane has a story for sure. And this just looks like a typical plane, whatever. Yeah, it was the last biplane to be used in the U.S. military service. So the, there you go. Up until 1961. Then obviously we moved all to jet engines. 
All right, so we'll get to this face, of course, later on. But this is one of my favorite things here, is the restoration wing, which, uh, that fleck bead, it's been in restoration for a very long time. It was here the last time I was here, like three years ago. But definitely some other stuff I've never seen before. And I swear that looks like something out of Star Wars. They do have an informational video that plays and uh, tells you about just all the detail they go into restoring things, using as many parts originally as possible, but in some cases, you know, things have deteriorated to the point where they have to recreate it, and they use a lot of really cool techniques to uh, sometimes fill in the, the pieces, basically. And that was right. Yes, it is from Star Wars Rise of the Skywalker. Which I'm not surprised, it seems like the Smithsonian likes to embrace some pop culture stuff. Definitely to just create more interest in the museum it's, in itself. Like you can say, find the Galileo, which was the transport vehicle um, in Star Trek, in the main museum in Washington DC on display. Yep, it's neat they have this little display right in the center here where it tells you everything that's in rest restoration. As I said, that, that one plane that we saw, the green one, has been here for a very long time. And there's the Apollo 11 capsule, which obviously was the first capsule to take us to the moon. Pretty sure I've seen this on display at the museum in Washington, D.C., but currently under restoration. And then there is Amelia Earhart's plane. So I've been exploring like every nook and cranny of the place just to see what's in the places that people probably never think to like travel down and boom. I remember seeing this on Tested.com with Adam Savage, you know, of the Mythbusters fame. Uh, this was a collaboration acro across the nation pretty much of a recreation of the hatch of the uh, Apollo capsule and everything is 3D printed and it was created all over the nation and then they all came together to assemble it. It was really cool. I'll put the link to the video in the description. So neat. I was not expecting this to be here. So it's kind of a shame that it's in an area that's kind of doesn't get a lot of traffic. So, but uh, here it is. Very neat. I remember they had problems with the window fitting or something. I remember correctly. It's been, you know, a few years since I watched the video, since it was uh, basically over two years ago that they did this, so. But very neat, for sure. It was all in celebration of the 50th anniversary of the landing on the moon. This thing is just incredible. We've shown it already, but here's the plaque for it. I believe it is still one of the fastest planes ever built. Very neat. All right, I want to check out more of this over here, but before uh, let's go into the space because I've actually been here for two hours now, and uh, before I know it, I'll probably run out of time. So, and I gotta spend some time in the space hangar, of course. Before you even get into the hangar, I mean this is pretty neat. You know, this is a capsule that brought Alan Shepard first American in space, and uh, here's what he flew in. Can you believe it? Just being in that tiny little thing, bringing all the way up to the, just the unknown of space. So uh, here's a little thing telling all about the James Webb Telescope, which is uh, basically the successor to Hubble, and it's been delayed heavily. It was supposed to first launch in uh, 2018 and then the video at the end actually says it's launching on October 31st which is according to Wikipedia outdated at this point it's not going until December another delay um, these things take time but man so many delays and uh, here is the space shuttle I you know pretty cool <laughs> I love how they have it set up and 
how you just approach it head on. And uh, the thing is huge. I mean, next to the Boeing that we saw, it's not very long, but next to the Boeing that we saw earlier, or a lot of commercial airliners, the thing is just massive. And controversial as can be. So as it really wasn't the most cost efficient thing. We, we later discovered that after a few missions, but we were kind of, they kind of uh, stuck to it because of promises made and all that stuff and uh, didn't have a successor. We're finally actually getting back to space ourselves and not relying on the Russians to do it, which is great. And then the candidate arm, which is a space crane, which is pretty cool in its uh, own right. And I always love just looking at this joint right here. Uh, the amount of technology just in one little joint is just ridiculous. But there's also no denying the amazing things that it did and the diversity of what it could do. Even things that it was nowhere when it was first devised that we wouldn't even thought that we would be using it for, especially like servicing the Hubble telescope and whatnot. So, and you can get up right underneath it, which is really neat to see up close in person. I, I'm under a space shuttle right now. <laughs> that's, that, it's pretty cool. It's just fascinating that each one of these pieces of technology, if I was a YouTube channel that did things like that, each one of these things could deserve its own, you know, 30, 40 minute long documentary on it. Like this thing was used to analyze digital imagery from reconnaissance sat satellites. And it had a higher resolution black and white TV on the right and a color one on the left and those goggles were used to uh, show the images in three dimensions and then this here is before digital it's how we got back imagery it's basically a sphere the film reels were in there we detach from the satellite and then uh, parachute down and then be caught midair by a, uh, by a plane. And then the film is developed. And then that machine back there is, is a light table where you could analyze the pictures. It's just amazing how much detail there is in this one room. And, and then, then there's just a case full of models. There's a Saturn V and it just goes on and on. All I can say is you definitely should come here just since it's free, other than, you know, paying for parking. And uh, I've really enjoyed actually finally reading all these things instead of just kind of looking at them. It was just probably been uh, the wrong way to do it beforehand, if you're really interested in this stuff. But you know, I have a mild interest in this stuff, more than I'd say the average person. I really enjoy reading about these two because I really remember these two when they were launched. Well, there were two of the basically exact same things that landed on Mars. And I remember these more than anything because I remember uh, they landed in July. So I was at summer camp. I remember that. I remember seeing like newspaper articles or my mom sent me newspaper articles while I was at sleepaway camp, which is kind of cool, right? And now they're the size of a small car, basically. Whereas, you know, this is full scale and it's, it's basically a remote car and had limited capabilities. Not like we can't get enough views of this thing, but uh, very neat. Uh, so normally they would have volunteers around the exhibits to talk to you and you can answer any, answer any questions you may have, but right now they just have a uh, video conferencing, which is uh, a neat way to do it right now. And then the more capsules from the Mercury program. 
So here's a Gemini, which you can see is a little bit bigger and uh, holds two people. And then it had these huge doors that could be open, and that's when we had the first uh, spacewalk, which wasn't even really planned. It was a last minute thing to happen during that mission. And this is a pretty famous bus here. Uh, it was used for uh, isolation, a quarantine period, after they came back from the moon because we weren't exactly sure uh, if there was harmful things up there. So, uh, you've probably seen the video of all the, the three astronauts. You, you seriously can just spend so much time in here. And every time I come here, I'm thinking, I'm not going to be here for very long. Hey, a few hours, right? Nah, I've been here three hours, and I could easily spend a whole day here just reading more and more about every little item. So, space cameras. Those are neat. I mean, it's amazing. On the bottom shelf of this, you know, display case, this, this is what got us to the moon. It's a guidance computer. And, you know, it's such an amazing piece of technology. One that, I mean, your iPhone can do more than this thing can do easily. Uh, there's a really cool video series of um, a bunch of geeks who restored one of these things and actually hooked it up to modern computers and simulated and actually used this guidance system to run a simulation of landing on the moon and everything like that. It, it is so cool. I'll link to that playlist. Uh, it was just so neat. Them, uh, just, just ridiculous. Uh, and it's such antiquated technology that it was built to do one thing and it did it really well. I love that they do embrace some of the uh, science fiction stuff from Hollywood. This is, uh, some of this stuff is really neat. On this side of the hangar, a lot of military jets and planes. Uh, some that don't really interest me all that much, but they're really neat technologically in their own rights. So here is a F-14, which should look a little bit familiar because uh, this is what was flown in Top Gun and you know, they haven't been in service since 2006, but even just sitting here, they look like they're going hundreds of miles per hour. Just their shape and their stance. Oh, they're just badass for sure. And I think that's going to end it with uh, the only plane here that was at Pearl Harbor during the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. And uh, it's pretty neat. It also shows you that, you know, this is, was stored outside for many, many years, left to be forgotten, basically, and uh, that, that's what happens after a while. Things just deteriorate. And I kind of like that they left it as this to show you just the effect of, of what the elements can do to it, just eating through all the metal. As I said, there is so much to do and see here, and... I highly suggest coming and spending the majority of the day here. You definitely could use it if you're really into it or have a, you know, more than above average interest in that space and airplanes and all that stuff and everything related to them. There's just so many artifacts here. Um, it's overwhelming for sure. As I said before, uh, kids, I, I think they might grow a little bored pretty quickly after you see you know, the first 25, 30 planes, you know, to a kid, they're gonna start to kind of all look alike. But, I mean, it's still pretty cool. And, you know, there's an unmanned predator drone up there looking, looking over for everybody. It's kind of creepy, but that's it. Thanks for watching. If you're here for just this type of video, thanks for watching. If, if you like coasters, thanks for watching even more. This has been Alex for the Coaster Spot. Like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.